your name to the court. Detective Frank Kimball. Detective, where are you employed? I work at the Breckenridge County Police Department, right here in Midlands. And how long have you worked there? I've been there about uh, 10 years now. Did you have any experience prior to working with the Breckenridge County Police Department? Uh, before joining the force, I actually uh, put off going to the academy for a while. After my father passed, my mother became very ill. Um, so I actually worked as a security guard at Rockdale World before joining the academy to help provide for her. And how did you find out about this job at Rockdale World? Uh, well, Winston Thomas, he's the head, he was the head security guard there at Rockdale World, uh, was my father's partner. But he was on the force uh, before he was killed in the line. And uh, he had let us know that Rockdale World was looking higher. Uh, Detective, do you have any training for your job as a police officer? Uh, of course. Uh, all the guys at my unit, all, excuse me, through the police academy, um, there you get uh, basic training in all procedures, um, and then I also went into specialized training in financial crimes. What division of the police department do you work with now? Uh, FCU, the financial crimes unit at Breckenridge County. And what do your job entail as a member of the financial crimes unit? Well, at the FCU, I'm the lead detective, uh, so I oversee each step of an investigation. And during my time there, I've overseen probably about 200 different investigations. Detective. How are you involved in today's case? Well, I was contacted to look into a uh, discrepancy in Rockford Wilson County records, and I was also ultimately the officer who uh, arrested uh, Whitbone. You mentioned that you were asked to look into park finances and a discrepancy there. What did you do in, in this capacity? Well, I, I looked over their records on um, August 1st, and then after I made uh, my terminations, I went back to Rock to World on uh, August 29th to make some recommendations to see if that would fix things. And what did you do exactly on August 29th after you went to the park to make those recommendations? Uh, I checked in at the park that morning. Um, things seemed to be going pretty well that afternoon. Things were back on track according to their own records. So I set up a meeting with the owner at J.C. Longstreet uh, that afternoon around 8, so we could kind of go over everything as a, as a kind of a debrief. And which day was that, officer, that you had that meeting? It's August uh, 30th. And you said that you met around 8 p.m. with park management. Where did you meet them? I met at the main management office. And what happened while you were in that meeting with park management? While I was in that meeting, uh, we heard screams from outside. Uh, so naturally, I ran out the front door to see what was going on. Your Honor, let the record reflect that I am showing opposing counsel what has been marked as people three. Permission to approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Detective, do you recognize that? Yes, I do. What is it? This is a map of Rock to Roll. And how do you recognize it? I've seen it before when I've uh, gone to Rockford with my family, and it was also provided to me during my investigation. Is it a fair and accurate copy or depiction of what Rockford World looks like? Yes, it is. Would a map, a larger version of that map, would it aid you in explaining what happened to the jury on August 30th? Yeah, I think so. Permission for the witness to step down and make use of the demonstrative? Are you entering this document into evidence? No, Your Honor, we are not. Uh, you may. Do you have any objections to this at this time? Uh, not at this time, Your Honor. Point of order, I just ask that I reposition myself so I can walk with the demonstrative. Of course, you're free to move that below. Now, Detective, you mentioned you were in the main security office, or main park office, meeting with park management. Where exactly is that on this map? The main ticket office is here, right by the front gate, next to the water fountains. And you mentioned that you heard screams. Where were those screams coming from? The screams were coming from Haley Floyd. Uh, Haley Floyd was very distraught. She was laying next to the ticket booth, right here by the main gate. Uh, Your Honor, let the record reflect that the witness has circled the ticket booth on the map. The record was so reflect. Now, what was Haley Floyd screaming when you saw her at the ticket booth? Like I said, she was very upset. She was screaming, stop him, stop him. What did you see when you heard her scream this? Um, I turned my field of vision to see what was happening beyond the ticket booth. I observed two individuals running away from the ticket booth. Were you able to identify who those two individuals were? Yes. The first was Cameron Poole, and then the second one was Winston Thomas, the security guard at the park. And Detective, where is the closest exit to this ticket booth? Uh, the closest exit is the main entrance and exit. This is the primary entrance and exit for all customers and most employees. 
You mentioned that Cameron Poole and Officer Thomas were running away from that main exit. Where were they going? They were running into the interior of the park. They were heading in this direction. Your Honor, let the record reflect that the witness has made an arrow in the direction that the two individuals were running. Just to be clear, Counsel, uh, you are just using this for demonstrative purposes? Yes, Your Honor. And you would like the record to reflect it on a document that you are not entering into evidence? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Let the record still reflect. Uh, now, Officer, what happened when they were running in that direction? Once they got into the interior of the park, there was a gunshot. And at this point, they headed directly towards the tunnel of terror. Objection, Your Honor. Lack of foundation. Have you heard? You may. Uh, the witness just said that there was a gunshot, but no foundation has been laid uh, as to how he knows there was a gunshot prior to that property. Counsel? Your Honor, this witness has testified that he's been an officer of the law for 10 years. It's reasonable to assume that he would understand what a gunshot sounds like. Counsel, is your objection that we haven't heard? Uh, I believe the testimony was that he heard a gunshot. Is that correct, Counsel? Yes, Your Honor. Is your testimony that he doesn't have the ability to recognize a gunshot? Is that your objection? The witness said that there was a gunshot. He did not say that he heard a gunshot. It's important for the jury to understand the, dis the distinction of whether or not there was a gunshot effect prior or not. So your objection is to the difference between there was a gunshot and I heard a gunshot. Is yeah, correct. But for the members of the jury, so the evidence comes in clearly. Counsel, can you rephrase just on that minor point? Of course, Your Honor. No. Objection is over. Now, Detective, you said something about a gunshot. Can you please describe a little bit more about what you meant about that? Yes, as I was giving chase of the two individuals, I heard a single gunshot. It sounded like it was fired from a 38 revolver. And you mentioned that the two people ran in the direction of the Tunnel of Terror. What happened when they got there? As soon as they arrived at the Tunnel of Terror, uh, the first person, Cameron Poole, entered into the primary tunnel at the ride. Uh, the lights were still on. Once Winston Thomas entered into the tunnel, the lights inside the tunnel were cut completely off. So I paused at the entrance to see if the lights would come back on. The lights come back on? Uh, no. In the darkness, I heard several screams. So I drew my department issued sidearm and my flashlight, and I entered into the tunnel. And what did you see when you entered into the tunnel? Once inside the tunnel, I observed Cameron Poole exiting the back of the tunnel through an access door. And it's at this point in time I found Winston Thomas on the ground unconscious. Now, where exactly is that exit door in relation to this ride? Uh, the exit door is on the back side of the tunnel of terror, right here. And where exactly was Whit Bowman when all of this was happening? Uh, Whit Bowman was here. She was <coughs> in the tunnel of terror. Thank you, Detective. You may take your seat. Now, Detective, do you see the defendant in court today? Uh, yes, I do. And can you please point to her and identify her by an article of clothing she's wearing? Yes, she's sitting there at a uh, defense counsel table with a tan jacket. Now, did you ever have the chance to speak to the defendant in the course of your investigation? Uh, yes, I spoke to the, def to the defendant and gathered some text messages from her phone. Your Honor, let the record reflect that I'm showing opposing counsel what has been previously marked as people's four. Permission to approach the witness? You may. Detective, what is that document? Uh, this is a screenshot of the text messages from the defendant's phone. And how do you recognize it to be so? I took the screenshot myself after the incident. You said it was from the defendant's phone. How do you know it was from the defendant's phone? Initially, she denied owning the phone, but later she confessed to me that she did, in fact, own this phone. Who is the recipient of these messages listed on this screenshot? It is uh, S. Cam. Your Honor, at this point, people would move people's four into evidence. Do we have any objections? Yes, Your Honor. Here's a Counsel? May I ask? How is this not hearsay? Yes, Your Honor. The statements made on the behalf of the defendant are the party opponent, and the other statements on the phone, um, the ones that we believe are to be Cameron Poole, if I may proffer, Your Honor? You may. Under Rule 901, in order to authenticate this as Cameron Poole's uh, being the person that sent the message, we have to provide sufficient evidence to show that it is what we claim it to be. Now, Detective Frank Kimball just testified to the fact that Cameron Poole was the one being chased through the park, that the message sender was S. Cam, and if I may proffer, one of the messages says that thanks for letting me out, I'll talk to you later. All that would be sufficient to show beyond or by um, sufficient evidence to show that Cameron Poole was the sender of those messages. Counsel? Your Honor, um, I ask that that foundation for the authenticity uh, be laid prior to this exhibit being offered in evidence, 
And our original objection was hearsay. And I'm, to be specific, I'm objecting to the statements of Cameron Poole. 801D2 covers the statements of Iboma, but not Cameron Poole in today's trial. So, counsel, you are okay with the statements from Whit Bowman? Under 801D2, yes. Okay. But you object to the statements from this character, S. Cam? Uh, yes. Okay. And, counsel, your objection, your response to that, to the grounds of hearsay? Yes, Your Honor. For, as opposing counsel said, for the statements of Whit Bowman, those are the defendant. For the statements of Cameron Poole, under Rule 804B3, those would fall under an exception to hearsay. It has been stipulated to, and under Motions and Lemonade Ruling D, Cameron Poole is unavailable for these trials. These statements go against the interest of Cameron Poole because they're in direct relation to the crime. I respond, Your Honor? You may. Um, understanding that these arguments are constructively heard outside the jury, the jury hasn't heard that the statement, this text messages sent to a woman was, in fact, Cameron Poole. She proffered that it was, but that, that foundation has not been laid yet. So, counsel, would you be okay with this coming in if they lay foundation that this was these, uh, these were statements from Cameron Poole? Yes, Your Honor. With that limitation, I'm going to ask that you lay that foundation um, to get so the jury can understand that these are from Cameron Poole. Yes, sir. And if you uh, show that it is substantial evidence that these were Cameron Poole statements, and counsel feels that you have met that burden, then we'll allow that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Those restrictions. The objection is overruled. Lay the foundation. Yes, sir. Detective, who were you um, chasing out of the park on August 30th of 2012? Cameron Poole. And who is the sender of the messages on this phone? Uh, S. Cam. And in the messages, what is talked about generally speaking with the defendant? Um, the defendant sent a text that, uh, to wait for me and then asked, where are you? Call me now. And what is the response given from the sender S. Cam on this phone? Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay. Uh, specifically to the question. Counselor. Your Honor, I'm laying the foundation that the witness believes, on, again, under Rule 901, that there's sufficient evidence to show what he claims it to be. The, the statements are uh, Cameron Poole's statements, and he believes them to be so, and under Rule 804, they're not hearsay. Counsel, you have a shot. Uh, Your Honor, the statements of the woman were obviously 801D2, but I asked for a foundation of, for those text, the text messages to be from Cameron Poole. But this does not give counsel leeway to pursue inadmissible evidence to lay that foundation. The statements themselves are still here. Counsel, I'm inclined to agree. It seems like you're using the statements themselves in a circular fashion to prove that they that they are made by Cameron Poole. Is that correct? Well, yes, in in a sense, Your Honor. The fact that these statements uh, elicit certain things in response to exactly what the defendant says um, would be the sufficient evidence we need. And if I can direct your attention to some case law, Your Honor. You may. Um, State v. Beckett, Your Honor, it's on page number four of the case law. Beckett talks about threatening messages received by a victim when adequate proof um, was provided that the messages were sent by a defendant, and it says that circumstantial evidence is adequate proof to show that those messages were sent by the defendant. I understand that the situation here is a little bit different because the defendant and Cameron Poole are the two people involved in this, and Cameron Poole is obviously not the victim of the crime, but the state would feel that the intent of this uh, this case law is to show that when there's messages that are authenticated by one party and sent to the other and the messages and the content of them are uh, s sufficient enough to show that the sender and the um, receiver are who we claim them to be, that that, case, that, that would satisfy the uh, requirement to authenticate that person. Counsel. Your Honor, the state v. Beckett clearly states that the text messages must be received by the victim. Now, in today's trial, the victim has clearly been shown to be Officer Thomas. The state, the case law notes no variation as to his definition, so the opposing counsel to use a different interpretation would not be sufficient for these text messages to be admitted into evidence. Okay, let's do uh, one more round of responses. Last yeah. response, counsel. Yes, Your Honor. I believe that under this case law, it allows us to say that the content of the messages are relevant when we're 
going to show authentication under Rule 901. Now, in order for Officer um, or Detective Kimball to say that those statements were made by Cameron Poole, part of the reason that the jury would understand that they were made by Cameron Poole is the content of the messages themselves. That's why I'm asking Detective Kimball to elicit them based on top of the other things that he already observed in the park that day. Counsel, your final response? Your Honor, the state, the state being packet clearly states that it must be received by a victim and sent from the defendant. Now, we, we have half the, this foundation laid, but the other foundation for this case law to be uh, used has not been laid. Therefore, the uh, text messages cannot be entered into evidence. Okay, counsel, what we're going to do is we're going to admit the document to the portions that were said by the defendant. Yes. However, we are going to um, black out the portion where we do not know if it was sent by Karen or not. I don't believe you uh, laid enough foundation to show that there's adequate proof that those statements were made by Karen at this point in time. Yes, sir. So the statements will come in to the defendant's statements, however, they will not come in to any other statements. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, permission to approach and tender that document to the judge. <coughs> now, did the defendant tell you anything else in the course of your investigation? Yes, yeah, she told me that she did not know Karen Poole very well. Did the defendant mention anything about hearing a gunshot? No. Did you talk to anyone else in the course of your investigation? I spoke to Haley Floyd immediately after the incident. And how was Haley Floyd appearing to you when you spoke to her? She was still very shaken up, very distraught. What did Haley Floyd say? She told me that Cameron Poole used a whip bone as a knife. Now, Detective, you mentioned that you were the one who ultimately arrested the defendant. Why did you do that? After the statements from Haley Floyd that it was, in fact, the defendant's knife, and the fact that she worked the ride through which Cameron Poole escaped, I had no choice but to place the defendant under arrest. Thank you, Detective. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Would opposing counsel like to demonstrate?